I'm not very good at identifying plants by their leaves something I hope I learned a little bit more about when my son and I attended Cub Scout and Boy Scout camps. Do you want to avoid poison ivy? Everybody together now. Leaves of three, let them be. Sometimes I do a bad impersonation of a Midwest girl. 18 years ago when I moved here from inner city Chicago, I didn't know what a corn husker was Although I knew it had something to do with taking the husks off of corn, my mama didn't raise no fool. I didn't know who Dorothy Lynch was and why everyone here seemed to be good friends with her. And I confessed during a board meeting once for a mental health nonprofit that I was a part of, after a long discussion about a very nice and well-respected man, about whom people were going on and on and on about, I finally asked aloud in frustration, who is this Tom Osborne you keep talking about? <laughs> that particular meeting didn't end well for me, and I've been through a lot of therapy to try to forget it, so I'm gonna move on now. With the exception of the oak and the maple leaves, most plants and trees look indistinguishably green and leafy to me. In fact, when I discovered an app on my phone called Picture This, which identifies any plant or tree you take a picture of, I was elated. Has anyone else discovered this app? Finally, I can tell what kind of tree is blooming in my yard. I walk around taking pictures and learning all kinds of things. I need that help because of my lack of knowledge. But when I see the fruit on the plant, it's a different story. I can recognize an apple tree when I see apples hanging off the boughs. I can recognize a strawberry plant when I see red berries growing on it. I discovered that the tree in a field near my house was a pear tree, but only when the fruit came in. And it's the same for you and for me. Jesus wants all of us to be recognized by the fruit we bear. And what is the fruit we bear? It's love, love. It's one of my favorite hymns, they will know we are Christians by our love. If we abide in Christ, firmly rooted in his love and example, then we will bear the fruit of that love, and all will know we are people of faith because of it. And if he chose us for this work, then we can be sure he will exert all of his power to make us fruitful. To bear fruit is not just for our own joy and sake, it is that God might be glorified. As we talked about last week, if we go back a few verses before our text today and continue into the first few verses of today's reading, the word abide shows up 10 times in just seven verses. This emphasizes the way in which we can be empowered to bear fruit, and that is by abiding in Christ. Keep yourself attached, closely attached to the vine. And who is the vine? The one who said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. Jesus is explaining to his disciples the importance of staying connected to him through the power of the Holy Spirit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus speaks of bearing fruit over and over and over in these verses. And again, how do we bear fruit? We abide, abide, abide. Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. And as Lutheran pastor Nadia Boltz Weber says, our lives are uncomfortably tangled up together. The Christian life is a viney, branchy, jumbled mess of us and Jesus and others. And that's true. This is how we bear fruit. We do it together. A vine is not neat. As I said last week, it goes everywhere. It gets tangled up and wrapped around each other. 
And this is a wonderful visual of our lives as children of God. We get tangled up and wrapped around each other too, for better and for worse. This interconnectedness of the vine is a symbol of the fact that not only do we belong to God, but we belong to each other as well, abiding in him and through him with each other. Nadia continues, Christianity is a lousy religion for the I'll do it myself set. We're meant to be tangled up together. We're meant to live lives of profound interdependence, growing into, around, and out of each other. We cause pain and loss when we hold ourselves apart because the fate of each individual branch affects the vine as a whole. In this metaphor, dependence is not a matter of personal morality or preference. It's a matter of life and death. Branches that refuse to cling to the vine die. I don't always like this idea that I am bound to the community of God's people, whether such boundedness suits my wishes or not. It's hard to accept that every branch matters and makes up the life and nourishment of the world, because if I'm being honest with you, I don't always like the other branches. Sometimes they irritate me. Sometimes they frustrate me. Sometimes they discourage me. But I need to realize that I do that to them as well at times. And to cut myself off from the vine is to diminish my own fruitfulness. Now, I'm not going to speak for you, but often I seem to have a lot of fruit growing off these scrawny branches of mine that has nothing to do with Christ's love. It's closer to the parable of the wheat and the weeds, almost like an enemy has come and grafted these non-desirable nuisance plants into me. What I need to keep reminding myself is this. We will grow what we are rooted in. And when I root myself in things besides Christ, that's when I start sprouting fruit that doesn't taste very good. Fruit that might look good on the outside, but once tasted, it's clearly bitter. It's only through God's grace that I can bear anything tasty. It's only when I abide in Christ that I can bear fruit that will build up the kingdom of God here on earth. Now the fruit is the part of the plant that is beneficial to others. The fruit is a source of nourishment and life to all who partake. So when we bear fruit, we bless others. And this happens when we live as Christ lived, in serving others through caring and sharing and attending to their needs. The fruit is also the part of the plant that enables other plants to grow. Thus, a fruit-bearing disciple is one who helps God's kingdom grow. Our fruit has the seeds that will grow future fruit in God's good time because fruit leaves seeds that can be replanted. Jesus is reminding the disciples and us to invest our lives in the eternal, not the temporary. The fruit of our lives will last as long as we are living in him, and we should be seed planters of the good news. The Apostle Paul helps us understand bearing fruit a little better. He speaks of fruit in four of his letters, Romans, 1 Corinthians, Galatians, and Colossians. In Galatians, Paul lists the fruits that the Spirit desires to grow in us. They are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. In Colossians, Paul doesn't list a list, but rather speaks of four ways through which we come to bear fruit. First, growing in the knowledge of God. Second, being strong. Third, enduring everything with patience. And fourth, joyfully giving thanks to God. And then later in the letter, he does grow the list from the previous book, 
we add some more fruits of the Spirit, saying that we need compassion, humility, meekness, bearing with one another and forgiving one another, wisdom and gratitude. These are all fruits of the Spirit that we are asked to grow. That's quite a list, isn't it? That is a lifelong endeavor. But I think I know the baby steps that we need to grow fruit. We need to grow in our knowledge of God through prayer and worship, studying and listening. We need to root ourselves in Christ, who will be all that we need. And we need to joyfully give thanks for all things. Now, keep in mind that this conversation we're reading takes place on the eve of Jesus' crucifixion. In just a few hours, he will be arrested, tried, convicted, and executed as an enemy of the state. He endures all of this in order to demonstrate the love he has for his disciples, and indeed the deep and abiding love God has for the entire world. And he tells the disciples, I did not, you did not choose me. You did not choose me. Instead, I chose you. So in the midst of our attempts to bear fruit, we need to remember that Christ has chosen us as well. He chose us. And if he chose us, he will equip us. The knowledge that we are a beloved child of God causes us to live our lives in a manner that will set us apart from the world around us. And that won't always be easy. The world around us also asks us to be productive and to bear fruit, but it's a fruit of a different sort, usually focused on how we can better ourselves, better our pocketbooks, better our investments, better our waistlines, better our chances at success. Christ calls us to bear fruit that will better the world around us by spreading the good news in all that we say and all that we do. You and I, even though we are people of faith, look for results in worldly ways. God looks for results in kingdom ways. Because of the cross, we know that God has chosen us. The cross is not the evidence of our worth, but the source of our worth. Christ did not die for us because we were worthy, because we were not. We are worthy because Christ died for us. And in response to this, we live our lives in a manner worthy of this love. And through this, we bear fruit, fruit that will last. Do you remember playing kickball in elementary school during recess? or maybe it was baseball or football or whatever sport you guys played, but whatever game it was, you had to divide into teams. I was never chosen first, but I was also never chosen last. But do you remember that anxiety you'd feel and you'd try to pretend it didn't bother you when your name wasn't called? As grown-ups, we still wear that mask that tries to hide our hurt feelings at times when the world doesn't choose us. The good news today is that God chooses you. Each time, every time, every single day, every hour, every moment, God chooses you. We don't always deserve us it, but God still wants us on his team. And what a joy, what an incredible, amazing joy that is. Because if God is for us, who can be against us? What a boost to our self-esteem. Everybody wins. There's no first place, second place, or first chosen or last chosen. We're all chosen. We're transformed by Christ's love for us. Whether this is a lifelong, gradual transformation that we might not even notice at first, or a road to Damascus, blinding light, everything changes in an instant transformation such as Paul had, the end result is the same, a transformation of our own bitter fruits to fruit that lasts. And it's never too late for this to happen. 
No matter what we've done, no matter how many wrong turn, turns we've made, no matter how bitter and unripe our current fruit is, that doesn't matter to God because every day is a new beginning, a chance to start again. Maya Angelou once said, we cannot change the past, but we can change our attitude toward it. Uproot guilt and plant forgiveness. Tear out arrogance and seed humility. Exchange love for hate, thereby making the present comfortable and the future promising. We can do all things through God who strengthens us. And ultimately, as the end of our text reminds us, it's not our decision, it is God's decision. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. So no matter how unworthy we might feel at times, no matter how badly we may have messed things up at times in our life, God continues to choose us, and God's desire for us is to prosper. This has become one of my favorite scriptures because it reminds me that it's not something I have to earn. It's not something I have to be good enough to get. It's not something I can lose if I make a bad decision. It is God's choice that I bear fruit, and it is God's choice that you bear fruit as well. Jesus reminds the disciples that their place with him is the result of his initiative, not theirs. Relationship with Jesus is the result of God's grace. But as I've said before, we still have a role to play. We still have to say thank you and accept the grace because it's never forced upon us. So today we need to ask ourselves, how am I spending my life? because every day is precious. Every life bears some type of fruit. The question is, what kind are we bearing? Is it the temporary fruit of the world that looks nice on the outside, but's empty inside and tastes horrible? Or is it the lasting fruit that's born from a life that is connected to and rooted in God? It sounds like a tall order, doesn't it? Where am I gonna fit all this fruit bearing into my already overwhelming schedule? Work, home, laundry, bills, now I gotta grow fruit too? Take heart, we're not doing all this fruit bearing alone because we're rooted in and abiding in and making our home in the one who gives us all strength and nourishment and hope that we need to endure. Jesus said, I am the vine. Let me be your source. Put your hope in me. Put your energy in me. Live your life for me. If we choose, we can all be firmly planted to him. If we choose, we can each and every one of us be transformed by a new reality in which we are empowered and equipped and called to be Jesus' disciple and bear fruit. Just as Jesus was intimately connected to his Father, so we can do nothing unless we are intimately connected with Jesus. When he says that we cannot bear fruit apart from him, it's not a threat. It's not meant to frighten us. Rather, he's inviting us to a new life and is promising to be the fulfillment of our needs. So do you feel there's room for improvement? Of course there is. I can grow in my faith and so can each one of you because we never quite attain perfection in this life. But hopefully we're always moving closer to it. Let the fruit of your life be love. 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 So that the whole world can see that we are not judgmental, we're not hypocritical, we're not selfish, but rather we are about grace and hope and respect for others. And this comes from love. And we can love because God first loved us. Thanks be to God that God loves us. Thanks be to God that God chose us. Let us go and love one another and bear the fruit that lasts. Amen.